Hello everyone, my name is Charlie Ely and this is the first in a series of short video lectures designed for your BA Contemporary Dance Performance in Context module. These videos are designed as introductions to theories about dance that you can then apply to your studies of a particular dance or choreographer or to your own work. I hope that you'll find it useful to come back to them in the future. This video focuses on the roots of dance and what we might call ethno-choreology or dance anthropology. It's the same thing. And it's not, as the first word might suggest, just about ethnicity or ethnic dances, but it's a way of looking at dance that draws from and links with philosophy and the social sciences. So it's something that we can apply to ballet or hip hop or contemporary dance as well. More simply put, it's about why we dance and what it means. Here we're looking at the development of some non-Western forms, that is, forms from the global south. And I encourage you to think about what might seem similar or different to what you know about the history of Western, European and American dance. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Leeds. I've always danced and I took dance A-level outside of school. I did my BA in English Literature and Drama and I became increasingly interested in physical theatre and other movement-based forms of performance. I then did an MA in Theatre Studies and focused on dance theatre. In 2017 I went to spend six months in East Africa spending one month working with a Kenyan theatre company. Whilst there, I saw a lot of indigenous cultural dances, but I also saw some cutting edge contemporary dance, which was a big surprise. In particular, I attended the premiere of the first solo dance theatre piece by a female Kenyan choreographer, and I felt like I really related to her aesthetic. I discovered artists and groups making similar work across the region, and this led to my current research, which is an investigation into the constructions of identity by contemporary East African choreographers. It's an emerging art forms which blends dance styles and theatrical techniques, both local and international. My thesis suggests that it can help us to understand how notions of identity are changing in the region in relation to modern issues such as travel and migration, the knowledge of languages, technology, and the internet. My research also looks at the structures and politics of performance making in the region, things that really need to change if art forms like this are to have a sustainable future. As a white British academic, I'm very aware that there are elements of the cultures and the art forms that I'm researching that I will never fully be able to access. So I'm not claiming to be an authority on them. At the same time, there are also sometimes benefits to be found to researching as a cultural outsider. There are certain biases that you might not have and certain things that you might not take for granted. I'm also trying to counteract my outsider status and Western privilege by focusing on embedded research with several artists and interviews. I'm trying to create a platform for East African artists' voices and an appreciation of their work in the UK and hopefully wider too. Lastly, I think that this has become an interest of mine, partly because although the UK is still 80% uh, white British and 85% white, I grew up in central London and being part of a very multicultural environment feels like it's part of my identity. I firmly believe that we need to dismantle American and Eurocentrism in the performing arts, that art can connect us, and that learning about other cultures is a key means of creating a more ethical mode of living as a global citizen. So, roots. How can we talk about the roots of something like dance, which is so ephemeral and yet clearly existed long before we had anything other than oral transmission? The spoken word to document it. The current research suggests that song and gesture came before spoken language. It doesn't follow that dance came before other movement such as walking. Our first step towards it was becoming bipedal. Then we developed rhythmical and repetitive movements. 
what Andre Grau calls proto-dance. She explains that moving together is something pleasurable and you find that it makes work easier. For example, getting into a collaborative rhythm with someone. Grau also tells us that the Victorians were particularly preoccupied with dance origins, as they were the origins of the species. It's worth us considering the context in which this Victorian scholarship was done. One of educations for the masses, industrialization, and empire. They traced an evolution from primitive through to folk dances, through to classical Western forms, through to ballet and concert dance. They thoroughly discounted virtuosity in non-Western forms and created this false hierarchy that still needs some undoing. There are many reasons why the quest for dance origins is moot and can only ever be speculative. There may be an engraving of a masked dancer in a French cave dating back 10,000 years, but we will never know exactly why. The difficulties for ethnochorological research include a lack of written documentation, reductive generalisations and historical racism, and the actual banning of certain dance forms by colonial powers. Fortunately, strong oral and physical traditions of dance exist in some cultures, and these have helped scholars understand different historical purposes of dance. If we synthesise the ethnographic research done into non-Western, pre-colonial forms of dance, if we look at the metadata, we can say confidently that there was always a desire to communicate, to entertain, educate, mourn, celebrate, encourage, initiate, to praise, to warn, to heal, one common claim that we need to overturn is that all pre-colonial dance had religious or ritualistic origins. The evidence doesn't support this. Some dance forms seem to have been entirely secular, born from a deep connection to the seasons and nature in rural societies, linked to both practical and manual labour and celebrating good harvests. In societies where there is not much material accumulation, particularly nomadic societies, Performance has also been used as a means of acquiring social status. Father of performance studies, Richard Schechner, has conceived of this as seven interlocking spheres of performance. There has also been a general emphasis on the communal and participatory nature of pre-colonial performance, but the motivation to dance could also be individual. Jane Plasto tells us that in the Morogoro region of Tanzania, the Dagubi dance was performed by a group of women to one young female initiate in private. And in the Sukuma region, the Mbina Ya Mbasa dance was carried out by the parents of twins, along with a traditional um, healer and spiritual leader. It's also worth remembering that across the global south, there were both centralized states, like kingdoms, and stateless societies before colonization, and the different kinds of societies are likely to use performance in different ways. I'll turn now to three examples that I hope will both explain some of these points and raise some more questions. One of the most widespread forms of pre-colonial performance combined dance, drama and both vocal and instrumental music. There are a myriad of these forms across Africa and they're generally known as dance dramas. In Tanzania, the word is ngoma. Now, pre-colonial Tanzania was mostly formed of small stateless societies. They have over a hundred ethnic groups. Jane Plaster informs us that Ngoma often originated as a form of village or clan unity. So there's a strong link between this idea of social unity and the organization and beliefs of these societies and their conception of Ngoma as a holistic collection of art forms. There was not a separate performance space. Ngoma occurred in the shared central space of villages. Before we get to Rosie, a picture of this scene. While social unity is generally a good thing, it can involve a drive to conformity. And there were many Ngoma whose messages repressed difference or highlighted prescriptive societal roles, often to the detriment of women, younger people, and others who are marginal in society. 
healthy societies need some dissent. They need power to be challenged from time to time. Sometimes dance drama did respond to social debates and acted like, in David Kerr's words, a safety valve, allowing a society to, to maintain a cultural continuity through licensed criticism. One thing we can say with a lot of confidence is that historically across cultures, as Plasto puts it, the more complex a state becomes, the more its theatre forms fragment, with specialist artists appearing to serve increasingly differentiated class, craft and caste interests. As an aside, we might consider how much this has changed since postmodern performance practices and multidisciplinarity have become popular. Alongside the many stateless societies, from medieval times, the Waswahili were prosperous traders who built city-states along the coasts of Kenya and Tanzania. This meant that they were in a unique position to mix considerably with different cultures, including porters and slaves from the African interior, and Amani, Zanzibari, and Indian merchants and migrants. The cosmopolitan Waswahili formed competitive dance associations long before formal colonisation began. Dancing was used to express collective pride in a group, and so to differentiate and stand out from the other groups, they picked up whatever they thought was best from the different cultures that they interacted with. This natural inclination was then fed significantly during uh, first German and then British colonisation. Through the impact of Western education, Christianity, new urban centres and increased transport and communications networks. The Beni and Goma developed in the 1890s and it was a hybrid of existing and Goma and ideas taken from colonial military parades and bands. Many East Africans were inspired by the new sounds that they heard from complex brass instruments. The Beni groups had names like Kingi and Scotchy seemingly showing uh, affiliation to the British crown, loyalty, and an attempt to fit in with the colonial cultural hegemony. However, it also became a super tribal form. Groupings were not based on ethnicity, but on occupation or geographical location. In this way, it counteracted colonial divide and rule tactics, and it even helped to develop communications networks used by political organisations. Benny and Goma was a male dance style, but women similarly had Lila Mama dance groups, and these were tied up with the notion of female emancipation. The Benny craze travelled as far as Malawi, where it is still performed as a cultural dance today. The Nijinya Kingdom of Rwanda was a significant pre-colonial African kingdom that emerged in the 17th century. Unlike the Waswahili city-states, this was a heavily militarised and unified state with a caste-like social structure. It developed two distinct categories of dance, those of the royal court and those that were popular people's dances akin to the situation in, say, Elizabethan England. Recruited from the age of 10, the Intore were elite warriors. They were also artistically trained and indoctrinated to enjoy, as historian Jan Vecina puts it, the exaltation of violence and the right of the strongest that became the universal theme of all literary and choreographic artistic forms. Correspondingly, there was a high importance placed on virtuosity, both for aesthetic interest, but also to demonstrate athletic ability. German, followed by Belgian rule, made the role of the militaries redundant, and so the focus of Intore training gradually shifted towards music and dance. In contrast to Tanzania, Rwanda is a small, landlocked and mountainous country with one society, and it's been notoriously difficult to travel to and from over time. Furthermore, its colonisers didn't suppress performance forms in the way that the British did. These are both factors leading to an absence of organic or enforced change in Intore dances. The specific movement vocabulary hasn't been hybridised with forms from other cultures. The esteem in which Intore dances were held has allowed them to continue in a more civilian mode today. In fact, 
They are probably the most celebrated of all these stuff that can dance. From the 1930s onward, they were gradually decontextualised with civilian forming groups, and eventually women were allowed to participate. Uh, now, dances like the Umusha Guerrero are specifically performed by women. The dances were adapted to new political contexts and became part of a shared cultural heritage. In recent decades, they have been used to help erase history and distinctions between Rwandans begging the question of at what point this drive for unity becomes problematic. There are times when it can deny the differences of minority cultures. The Tiwi are a small Aboriginal community in Northern Australia who until recently were very isolated. Andre Grau conducted research with the Tiwi in the early 1980s. They have a unique concept of the origin of dance, as she explains. The TV would argue that Perk Pali, the hero from Dreamtime, the mythological time when the world was created, choreographed the first dance to mourn the death of his son Tanani. He then taught the TV a sequence of dances so that they too could commemorate the dead. So dancing is done to honour the dead, but at the same time we can see how it can create honour within oneself. In making the effort to perform to the best of one's abilities. At one point in time, TV dance was exclusively reserved for commemorative rituals, but its application gradually grew to include celebrating the living. In the 1980s, she saw it used to honour people at their weddings or on their birthdays. Each kin group has a separate dance. The brothers and sisters have their own dances, so do the in-laws. These dances have been going on for many days. Grau calls them kinship dances, as through them relationships could be, in her words, marked, emphasised or even challenged. One example is of a woman refusing to perform a dance for a particular deceased male relative, expressing her belief that no further women should be given to that branch of the family. Sending her message through dance was safer than actually speaking it. Kinship dances were also classified by ownership. They belonged to their choreographers and their descendants. They passed through the male family line and only members of that group were allowed to perform them. There were a few exceptions to this rule. Dances that were said to be choreographed during the dream time and so were for everyone. In contrast to the Rwandan and Tore dances, uh, there was no foregrounding of virtuosity. These kinship dances were very simple and there was also little room for creativity. They were also something that every member of society must do, no special performers. And they had a direct social and political purpose to the extent that they informed personal relationships and dynamics rather than representing them. Lastly, Tiwi kinship dances and Rwandan and Tori dances were just that, dances. They were not holistic, multidisciplinary performances, unlike Ngoma. So what conclusions can we draw from such ethno-choreological research? One, dance always has a social function. No matter how much we place the emphasis on performance and staging, even when we think about the Victorian theatres and opera houses, they place the boxes facing each other because being seen was more important than seeing the show. Two, in general, there has been a move from holistic to separated specific performance forms. We should bear this in mind as we think about modern multidisciplinariness. Three, the idea that all pre-colonial performances were participatory is a fallacy. There were often specific performers, whether they were permanent roles, such as the Intore, or roles that you took on for a particular event, like the TV kinship dances. Four, and this is the main point that I want to get across, which is if we can identify a constant across the development of non-Western dance forms, then it is going to be the continuity of change, or what I like to call a tradition of evolution.
With that in mind, it's best to avoid the term traditional dance and to talk instead about cultural or indigenous dances. At no point can we isolate pre-colonial performance forms from the forces of physical or cultural migration. Dance is never static.